So as of today, I do not believe, well, as of Sunday, I don't think that Okada has actually signed an AEW contract I don't, I don't, I have, yet. Yeah, yeah. But I, the belief is that he is going to AEW. Yeah. I mean, I think that that belief has been there for, for weeks. But um, I know as of Wednesday, I, he has not signed. But the feeling, they were pretty confident that he, you know, so he may have signed in the last day or two, but they were pretty confident that, that he'll be going. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I mean, it's like another fantastic wrestler. Um, I mean, they're just loaded with talent. You know, I mean, Mercedes is starting and, you know, you could go and look and go like of the three big free agents, Will Ospreay, Okada and Mercedes, you know, they got they got all three um, in this run. And yet it's it's like the. I don't know what the word is. Perception of the company is such that it's like if this was if this was like a a year eighteen months ago, and they signed these three people, it would be like, oh my god, it's it's going to turn around, and it may, it may, but it's like I mean, not turn around, but just get bigger. Uh, but now, like the perception of the company is such, they got to do something about that perception because it's you know it's it's down i mean these crowds most weeks are not good and these guys who are you know and and women i mean uh, mercedes um the boston show you know i think is at about 5700 tickets you know sold on the first couple of days which is you know obviously for an AEW show that's very good it's not through the roof um but it's not like you know going to be a, it's not i don't think it's going to be a sellout i think it will you know, again, it's uh, it's only a couple weeks away, actually. But um, you know, it'll it'll be a good crowd and it'll be a hot crowd. I'm not I'm not sure. It's funny. Someone talked to me this morning about this, and it's like, why didn't they just announce that she was going to be there? Because what happened was a lot of people watched that, and it's like they were expecting this big announcement, and they were just doing this. He cried wolf. All oh, his announcement is there's a show with a name in in Boston. It's like, well, if you're an insider, and that's the problem. Of course, we all know what it is, but most fans actually don't. Um, with Punk, it was so big that like you could get away with that, but I'm not sure that in this case it was. And I don't know what like what is the reason for not announcing it, other than it was very successful the first time when they did it with Punk. Well, I mean, you you if you want to try to redo the Punk thing, then you do. But if it's clear that it's not doing Punk business, then you can announce her. They still have time. I yeah. mean, they could announce her Wednesday if they wanted to. I mean, it was the same thing with Punk. It's like the Punk thing worked. But if yeah. they had started doing these teases and everything and the fans just, like, weren't getting it, you could have just announced CM Punk had sold the place out. So I'm not saying if you announce her you're going to sell the place out, but you might do better than you're doing now. I would think that I would think that you might as well announce her, though. I mean, I don't, I don't like, I don't see a reason not to. With Punk, I mean, it was kind of like there was this – mystique and everything like that and 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 the, but the company was really strong at the time you know it's different you know not that the, i mean in some ways they're still strong but i mean financially they're strong but um but you know like when you're having trouble selling tickets i think that you know these mysteries aren't quite as effective as when you're you know you're doing pretty well every week well, we had a New Japan show this weekend, and it included what uh, may end up being the match of the year, which was Brian Danielson, Zack Sabre Jr. 2. And uh, they went 32 minutes. It was an absolutely fantastic match. They had so much was... awesome technical wrestling. They also beat the shit out of each other. Sometimes I wonder with this Brian Danielson, with all the concussions he's had... It's like he sure isn't careful. No, I mean I saw and stuff not just he, not just stuff he's taking, but stuff that he's delivering. Both, I know. I mean, my God, he was brutalizing Zack Saber Jr. and then Zack's kicking him in the face, and he's, he's slapping him in the, him face, in the face, and slapping and him hard, and doing and the, the headbutts, the headbutts. Yeah, I'm like my God. But I mean, if you want to see like a match that feels like. You know, this is one of those matches where what would pro wrestling look like if it was real? Well, it would be this because it basically was. I mean, you know, all you know, the you grappling know. and all of the striking and all of the, I mean, it was it was brutal. It was, I mean, technically a masterpiece. 
And in the end, Zack Sabre Jr. caught him with a crucifix and pinned him. And then Brian Danielson raised his hand afterwards and essentially said that I'm no longer the best technical wrestler in the world Zack Sabre Jr. is. And they're clearly building to a third match. Two out of three falls. Danielson saying best of three. And, I mean, the story is that they're trying to figure out who the best technical wrestler is. And Zack was upset that Brian won the first match with a strike, the the Basaiku knee. And this time, you know, Zack cradled him and pinned him, but he didn't submit him. And they made a big deal about the fact that neither man was able to submit the other. So I think that third match is probably going to end up being, you know, knee in the first fall, cradle in the second fall, and then who is going to submit the other in the third and uh, win this series? I would figure all in. I mean, I don't know this, but I, I mean, when they when they announced all in, I figured, you know, given the timing that that's going to be one of Danielson's last big matches, um, I thought that the the thing to do at all in was Danielson losing to Saber. That's why when they did this match in Osaka, I was thinking like this should be in London. But when they when, when they were over, and when it was all over, it was like they want to do another one in two out of three. And I think that that's, you know, I could see from that standpoint of Brian Danielson, you know, who's being being really, one of the things that's happened this year um, is uh, Tony Khan's really letting, like, Brian Danielson do Anything he wants. he wants? Yeah, well, what he wants, yeah. Yeah, he's giving him that. He's, I mean, he's letting a lot of guys do that. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> some people say too many, but, you know, he's letting Sting do what he wants. Um I mean, in other ways, it's like it's kind of cool. You know, I mean, Brian Danielson's going to go out. Like, Brian Danielson's going to go out scripting his his last year, you know? Like, Sting's going out scripting his last match. And I, I just figured, you know, it's, it's funny when I was watching this match because about 10 minutes into the match, and Brian Danielson's, like, doing something, and he just gets this giant smile on his face. And um, I don't know if you saw the pro, the post match promo, but he just goes, I just love New Japan. I love this. And I was just thinking, like, dude, you know, he he made a life decision. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like where he left WWE and Vince McMahon, who you know, I mean, he's very checkered, but but Brian certainly liked Vince McMahon. I don't know what he thinks of him today, but certainly loved him at the time, and you know, had family there and had all the reasons and many many people heavily pressuring him not to leave and you know like this is kind of like when he was in the ring with zach in japan it's kind of like this is what he left for i mean like you know yeah he wanted to go to AEW and 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 he thought it was the best thing for wrestling which is part of it but it was like when he was out of action. I mean, he watched all those Zack Saber matches from from New Japan Pro Wrestling, and he wanted to be there. You know, he got to wrestle uh, Yuji Nagata again. You know, he got to wrestle Hachisaro. But this was the one. You know, this was the match of all matches. You know that that he was sitting there on the sidelines, not allowed to wrestle, and watching this guy who he'd wrestled once before in front of um, forty five people and a few barn and a few animals. <laughs> <laughs> in England, um, when when what was it uh, like 15, 15, 16 years ago, and you know, I mean, Zach was just coming up at the time, and now, I mean, he really wanted to wrestle this guy, and man, this was this was a classic professional wrestling match. It it actually at points in the match reminded me of like Volkan and um, Kyoshi Tamura, you know, like that kind of a match. Um, a lot of a lot of Volcon actually, and um, you know so yeah. I mean, I it, it's a match like if you're if you are a serious wrestling fan. I don't know that like an average person on the street. If you go like you want to show them a, a wrestling match, that this is the one to show them. But if you're someone who is uh, a serious fan of wrestling, I mean, I loved all thirty two of those thirty two minutes. I just loved this match, other than the headbutts and everything. But but I mean, it was just the the smoothness of the match and the thought process in the match and the skill level in the match i mean it's just it was just amazing yeah it could it could win match of the year and i'm sure we'll place um you know that was it was better than the one in seattle and the one in seattle was a freaking great match 
Also watch the Okada Tanahashi match, their final New Japan match ever. And I think the best way to describe this match is if you imagine that these two guys have been in WWE for the last decade, WWE, and they've done all of their pay per view main events and they've been fantastic matches, but then you like buy a ticket and you go see them do the match at a house show. And they do the house show version of one of their classic matches. And they're so good that it's still like a three and three quarter star match. But it's not like, you know. How is it compared to the San Jose match? Um, I don't know. This this was 16 minutes. I mean, honestly, if you close your eyes and you think 16 minute, really good Tanahashi Okada match, like you can call this match from start to finish. I mean. That's because San Jose was kind of like that. It was, yeah, it was playing the hits. I mean, Okada ended up winning with the uh, Rainmaker, got the pin clean. Do you think he should have? And, uh, well, he's got a couple of more matches. I mean, yeah. I, I, they really I played it up like he was an all-time legend. He's crying well, coming out. Well, he is an all-time you know, they, legend. He was crying in tears, just like uncontrollable crying after it was over. Hugged Tanahashi, kissed the mat. The place is going nuts for him. But it was funny in the match. He comes out, and the crowd's going nuts with Okada chants. And Chris Charlton says, well, Tanahashi's going to have to wear that black hat tonight. And literally, he hadn't even finished saying that when the crowd suddenly starts chanting for Tanahashi. Yeah. And so Tanahashi, essentially, for the, like, the body of the match, he was the babyface. And Okada would be getting heat, and they would boo Okada. And like they were totally behind Tanahashi. And then they do the big near falls there at the end, and finally it's the Rainmaker. And as soon as he won, it was like, okay, now we're going to you know show our, our respect for Okada, how much we love him, and... You know, they're just going nuts for him. He's crying. And, I mean, it was a very, very classy send-off. Very classy send-off. Well, he's, still got, he's still got two more matches to go. Yes. And obviously, if he's going to AEW, you know, I'm sure he'll do other New Japan matches. It's so weird to me, though, because it's like, like, again, I mean, I mean, one of the things, it's like nobody in, in you know, in the history of Japanese wrestling, nobody at the level of Okada has ever left. You know, I mean, like, they'll, like, left the company. You know I mean? Like, they'll go on tours, but, like, you know, they never worked for a U.S. promotion. And, and some of it is the, the just basically the discrepancy in, in pay is so, is so great as compared to other eras where the top guy would still be paid, you know, very, very good and wouldn't want to leave, you know. And they would go to the United States, but they would, you know, want to stay in Japan and all that. And, um... You know, it's just weird that, that, you know, this guy who's like, you know, really like the, the number one guy. I mean, there's without a question. He's the number one guy in Japan and he's leaving. And, um, well, I mean, I, I, I'm i sure he'll do well. I'm sure he'll be booked well. You know, he'll be one of those guys that we're going to see on AEW television like all the time now. And, um, you know, but New Japan's going to have to, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, Make new stars, I guess. I mean, luckily, you know, I I just hope that in in uh, Sapporo at the end of the month, that uh, you know, it's whether it's Uemura, well, Uemura and Suji have a have a hair match, so I don't think it's going to be either of them. So who, who and I don't know who else. I guess Shota. I guess he could lose to Shota, but I it just didn't feel like something that they would book. Just like in this one, I was thinking like, if this was any territory. I mean, the thing you would do is you have Tanahashi beat him, and I was pretty sure Okada was winning this match because it's like they just kind of slot him at a certain level, and you just don't beat him. I don't think he's going to lose on. I don't know. I I I think he should lose on the way out. I mean, that's just pro wrestling that he should make somebody on the way out. I mean, like like people made him. Hey, if you love this clip, have I got a deal for you? WrestlingObserver.com. You have a commute. Do you work out at the gym? Do you like listening to audio on your headphones or your earbuds or whatever the kids use today? Well, WrestlingObserver.com will give you all the audio you'll ever need in your life. Over 15,000 audio shows. Every audio show that we have ever done, dating back to 2005, is available for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. Every time a new show comes out, you can podcast it directly to your phone. If you have a commute... 
As noted, if you go to the gym, if you like to lift weights and listen to Granny review soap operas, well, WrestlingObserver.com gets you full access to all of these shows and all of these archives. You can go back and listen to TNA reviews from 2010. You can go back and listen to reviews of every WWE pay-per-view, every big story that's ever happened in wrestling. You can get access to that at WrestlingObserver.com. Plus, full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter every week. 40,000 words of news and information in pro wrestling. Why get all your scoops off Reddit, which aren't even accurate most of the time? Go right to the source, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. You also get Observer Archives dating back to 1990. So check it out today. Thousands of issues of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Tens of thousands of hours of audio. All for $12.99 per month or as low as $9.99 if you sign up for a year. You'll never, you'll never run out of audio if you subscribe to WrestlingObserver.com. So head up there, check it out today, and I'll talk to you again after a while.